try to start on time if we can. Everybody's time is valuable. Thank you so much for coming out. Now, is this, is, are we going to be using this? So I'm going to, I'm going to, I would, don't talk. Well, it works when I touch it. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you all very much for coming out. I'm going to be like 30 seconds here because we're here to, to hear about what uh, the Urban Lane Institute has, has provided and wants to give some insight on. And first of all, I got to thank you. Thank everybody from the Urban Lane Institute and the Ballmer Chapter for doing so much to help us and for volunteering and, and providing so much. I appreciate that. Also, our Economic Development Authority, I appreciate what they've done as well. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody here for coming out tonight and for working with us. It's been about six months. Hard to believe, right? About six months, and, and you all have lived through an awful lot. And you have persevered and, 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 and through persistence and resilience have, have really done amazing things. I know there's still a long way to go. And tonight is not the end again, but it's just another part for us to get a fresh perspective of some of the ideas that maybe we can do in the future. So that's why this was so important. I mean, we're all really close to this. And a lot of the folks who served on are serving on CAG and, and other things. But nice to have somebody maybe come from the outside and say, hey, we're, we've been looking at the same thing you're looking at, but maybe we can see it a little differently and give us some new perspective and then help us use that information to con coordinate with what we're already doing. And we'll continue to work on that, that plan for the future and to, to make sure that we're not only uh, recovering, but recovering even stronger than we were before. So uh, thanks again for coming out tonight. Thank you for all the partners I see in the room. Uh, I would recognize every one of you, but then we'd be here for a long time. So thank you all for being such a big part of our community. This is a community recovery, and, and right now uh, I can tell you that it, we're going to make it happen, and we're going to be stronger and better than ever before. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Larry Tweel from our Economic Development Authority, our Executive Director, and let him let you know how things are going to work tonight. Here you go. Thank you, sir. Well, good evening. I'm Larry Twee. I'm CEO of the Economic uh, Development uh, Authority for Howard County. And uh, like the executive said, just uh, almost six months ago, uh, we went through quite an event that really uh, has impacted us all. But when uh, life gives you lemons, it's time to make lemonade. And that's what really uh, we're in the process of doing. It has been a long, almost six months of recovery and rebuilding. And this is another step of the process. Almost uh, 950 employees, over 140 businesses, uh, comprise the Ellicott City District that we're talking about. It contributes. $123 million of economic activity uh, in the county. And that is an important piece of what this, uh, of, of what we're talking about. That's you know, an important piece of Howard, of Howard County's economy. So we've got this, uh, we've got the challenge of how do we rebuild and how do we recover? And like the executive said, that's what uh, this process was, was all about. The Urban Land Institute is a membership organization comprised of architects, engineers, uh, real estate developers, uh, economic developers, government officials. And the Baltimore chapter, um, you know, we have some of the best talent in the region as, as part of that. And we asked them to come in and give us some, some perspective on, you know, Ellicott City. And, you know, it is a quick two-day process, this technical assistance panel is something that they do across the nation for you know cities, towns, jurisdictions, everywhere. And with this kind of talent and that kind of uh, uh, you know service that they offer, we ask them to come in and you know give us give us some good ideas as part of a bigger process of what rebuilding Ellicott City is, is going to be. So that's what that's what this was all about. It was it was about keeping the conversation moving and giving us new ideas to incorporate into the overall countywide plan of rebuilding Ellicott City. And as part of uh, the the work that Economic Development Authority does, you know this this was the logical this was the logical part of that entire process. So that's what uh, this group of. Uh, Eight individuals have, have done over the past two days, almost probably 250, 300 man hours, 500 pages of, of research, and uh, engaged probably over 60 stakeholders in the community as part of this process. That comprised with their, uh, their industry expertise. They've come up with some, uh, you know, they put some good thought to it and come up with some good recommendations for us to think about and incorporate into our rebuilding process. So. With that, 
um, I would like to uh, introduce the, uh, the head of uh, this uh, esteemed panel, Brad Rogers. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Hello, I'm Brad Rogers with Advanced Placemaking, and I am lucky enough to be chairing this panel. I really want to thank uh, Howard County Economic Development Agency. They've just been truly incredible and are the reason why all this is happening, and it's just been a real pleasure working with them. And it's been a real pleasure, you know, I feel like I've met everybody in Ellicott City. I can't believe there are that many people in Ellicott City. We've um, spoken to many of them. Many of them are in this room right now. And the... Oh. That's okay. I, I just want to say that the, um, the level of passion, the level of care, the level of interest here in this community has been staggering. We can feel it in the, every person we met with, every time we walked on the block, people really care about Ellicott City. And, and I know this is not the first time that you guys have been involved in meetings about Ellicott City. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people here have been involved in meetings since the flood and have been actively, right? All right, how many people, leave your hands up if you were here having meetings on these topics the year before the flood, right? How many people have been having these meetings for more than five years? How many people have been having these meetings for more than 10 years? Has anyone been having them for more than 15 years? Right, how many years have you been having these meetings? 20 years. Can anyone be 20? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. Right, and we have forever. Forever beats 20 years. <laughs> Wonderful. My point in making this observation is twofold. First, it is clear that there is a dedication here which is true and real and meaningful and more powerful than any act of nature. The second thing is that meetings alone do not generate outcomes. We have been given a gift, a terrible gift, an awful gift that we did not ask for, a ruinous gift for many people. In one case, a, or a few cases, a, a deadly gift, but it is a gift nonetheless. It is what I've been calling an involuntary reset. None of us asked for this flood, but now we have it. And to not take advantage of the flood, to not take advantage of the moment, would be criminal. We need to use this moment to chart a path forward and think, the day before the flood, we probably all would have been glad to go to a meeting because Ellicott City wasn't quite what we wanted it to be yet. So now, now that we have this moment, let's really define what we want it to be and really get it there. While, while everyone is watching, while everyone cares, while everyone is engaged. And that's what we're here to give our suggestions about what that would look like. Larry did a great job introducing ULI. That makes my next couple of seconds much easier. ULI is an international membership organization composed of people who care about making towns and cities better and do that professionally. Uh, some of our leadership is here. Kim Clark uh, is from the Baltimore Development Corporation. We have other um, ULI uh, leadership here as well. And we have an incredibly talented and capable and really astonishing panel of people who I've just been privileged to work with. We were asked three questions, and they relate to one another. And you kind of got to do them in order. The first question is, what does Ellicott City really want to be? Not that what it is is bad, but what does it want to become? What's the next stage? Where does it go from here? The second question, as part of that, what retail mix would you need in order to achieve that condition? Right? If you want, what would it look like? Who would be there? What would people be doing? How would we be making money? And the third is, what steps do we need to take now in the short and medium term in order to make that a reality? Those are the three questions. So we've spent an intense 48 hours walking, meeting, talking, meeting, talking, talking, and meeting. Uh, it's been fascinating talking with you folks. And now we are going to present our initial findings. We're going to tell you what we think, and we're going to be honest about it. That doesn't mean that everyone is going to love what we have to say, 
but you can know that we really mean it and, and, we're, um, and we sincerely want you to know it. We're going to start with the first question. What does Ellicott City want to be? Here's our take on that. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. What does Ellicott City want to be, your Ellicott City? Um, we have looked at Ellicott City for two days, and we've listened to you for a day and a half. Here are the things that you told us about Ellicott City. You said it was unique, it was historic, it was beautiful, it was authentic. You told us other things as well, but these are the four things that you told us most often. These are the, the salient points that we heard from you. Mr. Executive, if you're still here, good. Uh, I'm not going to run for your seat. This is not why I'm about to say what I'm about to say. All of us on your, pa your panel think you were right. Your Ellicott City really is unique, historic, beautiful, and authentic. And I'm going to stress the word unique a little bit more even than you did. We're city professionals. We look at other people's towns for a living. We build them, we rebuild them, we design them. None of us have ever seen any place in the United States that's really like this. Ellicott City is unique, and we think that it is a really wonderful, wonderful place. We're going to make some recommendations, then we're going to go away. We don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to do it. But what we hope that you will carry away from us, if nothing else, is this. Do not aim low. Aim high. You have an extraordinary place here. It is what you say it is. And how many places are? We have never seen any place like this. Aim high. Do not aim low. Your seat is safe. I live in Baltimore City. But uh, here is Ellicott City in a map. It's got a main street, and it's maybe four or five blocks wide, and many of those blocks are steep. I probably don't need to tell you that. You probably all have much better legs than we do. Your town sits at a place where an extraordinary number of roads come together. You are within an hour's drive of five million people. You are part of one of the richest counties in the United States perhaps the intergalactic empire. Uh, it, a lot of things come together here. The Baltimore region and the Washington region come together here. A lot of things come together here. Uh, maybe that's why it's a fall line town. The most obvious thing about Ellicott City is Main Street. It's hard to miss Main Street in Ellicott City. It's long, it's interesting, it's varied but coherent, both varied and coherent. That's hard to pull off. Many of us are designers or developers. It's hard to design a place that is both varied and coherent. It takes time, it takes a community, and you've had time, and you've had a community, and your main street is both varied and coherent. It's a very great asset. Look at that. Look at that. People. Americans cross the broad ocean to walk down streets that look like that. This is your main street. You've got an absolutely extraordinary civic acropolis. The Howard County Courthouse is beautifully set and takes beautiful advantage of its setting. I don't think any of us realized we were going to see anything like that. It's a key part of your town. You've got, you've all told us this, the oldest train station in the United States. Those of us from Baltimore may say, well, a week younger, a week older. 
It's certainly a historic train station. You've got, <laughs> here you go, bet you've never heard this, we've, I've never said it. You've got the only really interesting, good surface parking lot any of us have ever seen. Parking lot D with the little French market and lots of other buildings. I have never in my life said, this parking lot is a great place. You are unique. <laughs> this is really, this is a, a unique civic asset. I've never heard of this. And look at it. I mean, it's not very photogenic because it is a parking lot. But I hope your eyes are better than my cell phone. Even my eyes are better than my cell phone. You've got an extraordinary parking lot. Good Lord. So we thought, what places are somewhat like Ellicott City? It's unique, but what's somewhat like it? You told us a lot about Frederick. And we thought, is Frederick like Ellicott City? Well, yeah. It's bigger. Uh, it's more urban. But yeah, we, we can see that. It's a, it's a, and it's an immensely successful central Maryland town. Shows that central Maryland towns can be successful. You don't have to be on the water. You don't have to be as big as Washington or Baltimore or something. You can be Frederick. We thought about St. Michael's. I wasn't the only one who thought about St. Michael's. My mom was from St. Michael's. I think about St. Michael's all the time. But I wasn't the only one who thought about St. Michael's. St. Michael's doesn't have hills and you don't have water. But otherwise, Ellicott City reminds us a lot of St. Michael's. And St. Michael's is a place that people really like. So one for Ellicott City. In Baltimore City, there's a neighborhood called Hamden. And Hamden reminds us some of Ellicott City. Hamden was a part of the Rust Belt 30 years ago. And none of us in Baltimore knew whether Hamden was going to turn out well. Hamden is turning out just fine. And whatever we can do in Baltimore City, you can do it twice over. Hamden is not a bad model for Ellicott City. In the city of Philadelphia, there's a neighborhood called Maniunk. Say it fast five times, Maniunk. Maniunk is probably the place that reminds us the most of Ellicott City. It's got a lot of topography, it's got a lot of stone houses, and has some fun signs. I'm not going to say anything about that sign. I didn't take that picture. But Maniunk is a successful, highly successful, amazingly successful retail street with hardly anybody living within walking distance of it. Sound familiar? And it's not just in America. Um, Ellicott City reminds us of certain places in Europe. Doesn't remind me much of Paris, but there are other places in Europe. And here's one of them. Ellicott City reminds me of just about every town I've ever been to in Ireland. This is a town in Ireland, a town called Burr. And I used a picture of Burr because I have friends who live in Burr and I think about Burr. But Ireland is full of towns that look like Ellicott City. Ireland's a pretty beautiful country. If you've got a town that looks like that, that's another one for you. And here's one. Ellicott City has lots of very steep hills. And people may tell you that your steep hills are a little bit of a problem. Well, if you've got a good town, steep hills don't have to stop you. Here's a town in France. It's called saint emilion It's near Bordeaux. Some of the best wine in the world comes from that town. The streets are very, very steep, but it doesn't seem to stop the people. San Emilio is a great town. And those people probably don't live in San Emilio. They're probably tourists, the way I was a couple of years ago. Um, steep streets don't stop tourists either. You have an opportunity in a number of places to rebuild your city with really fun urban art. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're just going to suggest that there are ways that people have fun in the rebuilding of old cities and towns. And you've got the kind of old city or town that artists can have fun in. You just have to pay them. And it can be fun. 
So what are we recommending? Here's a vision. What Ellicott City wants to be when it grows up next. Towns have to grow up every 30 or 40 years. What's it going to be when it grows up next? It's got certain elements. The most obvious is Main Street. Don't tear it down. Don't flood it. Don't burn it down. You've tried all those things. Don't do that. Um, it's basically a good Main Street. It is capable of being a regional attraction if you do the right things, and some of my colleagues will tell you in greater detail what they are. Uh, it should have better streetscape. It should have some trees, 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 possibly. Um, if you get really rich, like people in Howard County, maybe you would bury the wires. But um, your main street is obviously important. Your historic train station. I hope this isn't a sacred cow. I bet it is. This should be a destination restaurant with a celebrity chef. This is the gateway to your town from many places. This is a spectacular place. And even though it may be a sacred cow, it is an underused sacred cow. If you're going to have a sacred cow, you've got to feed it. This is an underused sacred cow, and it should be a destination restaurant with a celebrity chef. The second element that we notice is your extraordinary civic acropolis around the courthouse. And just take a look here. Here's Main Street. Uh, I don't know how this thing works. You know where Main Street is. And look at the green above Main Street. You own that. That is public property. Most of the time when we want to develop something, it's owned by 50 different people and half of them are in loony bins and the other half can't be found. But you own that. And we are told that your county is going to move your courthouse to some other place. Probably a sad thing in its way, but it creates a really spectacular opportunity for you, the owners of that property, to create what we think of as an extraordinary environment for people who visit you. I believe the phrase is boutique hotel. Probably not just one building. You have an ensemble of buildings up there. You don't own these cute little lawyers' offices, but when you move the courthouse, the lawyers will probably move sooner or later. And when people come to see Ellicott City, look what they will see. I'm sure there are parts of Athens in Greece that are down low, but who cares? People think about the Acropolis. You have an Acropolis. I think my Baltimore is pretty cool, but we haven't got an Acropolis. You've got an Acropolis. Aim high. Don't aim low. You own it. When you come down from the Acropolis, you have just built a fabulous stairway, and it leads you to an important street crossing at La Palaba. And that extraordinary street, and important, not extraordinary, but that important street crossing takes you to the only parking lot that I've ever thought of as a good urban place. And you need to care for this, and it will repay you. You need to put some serious design development thought into Lot D. What do you do with it? Uh, how do you use the water in it? How do you take advantage of the fact that it is an, whoops, that it is a natural amphitheater? And the buildings that shape it now shape it well. We didn't, you know, I wish we could have designed this for you this afternoon. But you should do this. This is a tremendous opportunity for you. This can be huge fun. So what is Ellicott City and when it grows up? A bunch of words, but they add up to things. It is a relevant upscale. It's upscale, I'm afraid. Aim high. Don't aim low. It's upscale. It's vibrant. It's got people on the streets. Uh, and some of my colleagues will tell you how to snag them. But start high. 
Don't forget that Acropolis. Make it vibrant. Art, fun stuff. It is a commercial corridor. It's a destination. And it leverages your assets, which are charming and unique. So aim high. Thank you. And now Rebecca Murphy will tell you how you might actually begin to go about doing some of this. Hello. Um, my part in this presentation is to talk for a moment about the retail, to, answer quest to start to answer question number two. What retail do you need? Historic Ellicott City is a unique destination retail experience that is undergoing a rebirth as a result of the 2016 flood. What comprises, what do successful retail districts typically have? They have signature anchors, whether they're regional or national. They have a balanced mix of all kinds of elements, dining, fashion, gift specialty shops, and entertainment. And as a general rule, they're pedestrian friendly. We re as we researched and spoke to everybody and thought about this, we really saw two important opportunities for Ellicott City. The first is to build off your existing strengths, your existing assets. The second is to add a regionally identifiable or some regionally identifiable retail and restaurant anchors in a balanced way that could serve to provide a revitalization catalyst. And the example that we came up with in the context of people mentioning Frederick to us was Volt Restaurant. Brian Voltaggio, a local to Frederick, planted his flag there in the form of Volt Restaurant. What that did was elevate all the rest of the retail. It brought other restaurants, it brought other retail, and it made Frederick a regional culinary destination. We would propose that, again, to create an identity or to create sub-identities to the historic district, that you could create three sub-districts, Upper Main, mid-Maine, and lower Maine. Each of those have distinctive yet integrated, they're distinctive yet integrated areas. They provide a location identity for retailers. You could say, I'm on Main Street, I'm in mid-Maine, or I'm on Main Street, I'm in lower Maine. So it's a way to identify yourselves regionally. And what we thought was we would structure those around the existing architectural landmarks and the existing kind of break points, either whether they're intersections or curvatures in the road or whatever. So we'll go through quickly and talk about each district. We also really wanted to think about the pedestrian experience. You know, how can we improve the pedestrian experience? and wanting to think about safety, think about wayfinding and signage, so that there's a consistent look and feel up and down Main Street. There's a consistent look and feel for your signage as you enter Main Street from either end. That we thought a lot about environmental design and streetscaping. You know, how can you, again, create a sort of cohesive look, a cohesive identity through the use of planters and you know, hanging plants, maybe think about lighting, the way you think about using period lighting, things of that nature. And to think a little bit about sort of how do you manage the traffic? Do you close the streets on Saturdays? Do you direct? I mean, what are the ways that you can ambitiously, and to use Charlie's words, aim high for creating a peak experience for people who come to you? So to get back to our three sub-districts. The other, the the interesting, one of the interesting things that we realized and thought about and were really educated about was that not only does Ellicott City serve a tourist constituency, you have a residential constituency. And part of that, that harkens back also to the pedestrian experience. But to think, as you think about Upper Main, Mid Main, and Lower Main, logically, Upper Main 
because it's the closest to the residential areas, might have the more residential services. And just to, just, I would just like to say that all of the establishments that we reference are really only examples. They're ideas that are based on things that we know of, either through Baltimore or through other regions. Obviously, you all will come up with your own mix, your own regional anchors, but we just wanted to provide some brands that we would consider as examples of the things we're talking about. So for example, you know, if you wanted to, at the top of Maine, you could have a specialty grocer. You know, often neighborhoods have little teeny tiny grocers where you can pick up dinner or you can, you know, gra you could go to the wine bin and then go pick up a steak. You could, I mean, just a small sort of service if you need milk, if you need eggs, maybe it's the locally, maybe you work with community farms, you know, maybe it's a locally sourced market. A hardware store, wouldn't it be great because you're in this lovely historical venue to have a small specialty hardware store that knew which church key you needed for this building or which, you know, to help you figure out what kind of shim to use or whatever, but just to have a small sort of locally focused hardware store. We heard a lot about the interest in having a family restaurant, you know, having some kind of fast casual place where people and their families could sit down, you know, and we thought about a mission barbecue, but really it could be anything you wanted. You know, it is an axiom of retail that it's often good to have more than one of a thing. So even though you have a great bookstore in Gramps Books, you could also have in Baltimore, there's, I don't know if you're familiar, there's this wonderful bookstore called the Ivy Bookshop, which is a very small, really well curated, independent bookstore that has developed a regional identity. It's where people come for book signings. It's, you know, you can sit, there are great comfy chairs. It's a wonderful little place. So you might have a place like the Ivy at the top of the hill to have some kind of pottery painting activity. I know that there is a pottery destination at in, low, in what we would consider lower Maine, but that's more of a make the pottery. This would be more of you take your kids, you buy a plate, you make the mug for Mother's Day kind of a destination. The visitor center is already there. So there's a wonderful sort of public gateway that welcomes you to Ellicott City from the top of the hill. And then you already have two really wonderful, you have a housewares, furniture store in Sukasa and Sweet Elizabeth Jane, you know, which is another sort of great clothing, kind of fun retail destination. So that's Upper Maine. Mid Maine would be really from where Precious Gifts and Taylors is down to Kaplan's department store. And we just wanted to come up with sort of an identity for Mid Maine. There's already a salon. Perhaps you could have a cultural venue of some sort. You could have a fitness studio, a bar studio, a Pilates venue. You could have a barber shop. Because one thing we were told over and over again is that Ellicott City doesn't seem to have a whole lot of services that might appeal more to men. So where you have your salon and spa, you could also have a barber shop. The quintessential gentleman is this very fun, cool barber shop in downtown Baltimore that has, you know, your big leather club chairs and you can a pool table upstairs, it could be a place, you know, for men to hang out while, I'm being horribly cliche and stereotypical, but men can hang out while their wives go shopping. You know, it's just a place to watch, they have the game on, et cetera, et cetera. You could do the same kind of thing with a cigar or whiskey bar, have some unisex clothing, you know, people over and over again, and this would appeal, you know, to the River Valley and the active, the active piece of Ellicott City and Howard County. You could have something like an Orvis or a, or a shop that a gift specialty shop that carries that sort of thing. And then again, you know, you could incorporate that with a high-end specialty shop, gift and specialty shop that, you know, might stock Alex and Ani just to give more, give people more opportunities to spend their money, to walk down the street carrying bags, because that then people, other people want to ask and it kind of feeds on itself. Lower Main, from Kaplan's down to the train museum. This, we thought, was really where your local focus is. This is where your makers are, your antique stores, everything that makes Ellicott City, Ellicott City. Then you could also have, you know, over and over again, people mentioned ethnic food as a possibility. 
there's a lot, we've seen a lot of runners and dog walkers, you know, so maybe you have a running store, you have a Charm City Run, or you have an Annapolis running store. Record stores are back in fashion. So not only is it trendy, but it also calls back to historic. You could put gallery space there. Several people suggested to us that it would be great to have a diner kind of a place or a breakfast kind of a place. So you could do that. The other thing that might be fun, looking at what Ellicott City has or could have, you could put a speakeasy kind of a bar, a high-end cocktail kind of a bar down in Lower Main while you're waiting for your table at the signature train station restaurant. Then to go back to our beloved Lot D. Best parking lot ever. Anyway, you already have ice cream and pizza, but you could do pop-up retail, you could do food trucks, you could have farmer's markets, you could have maker's markets. You could use, we were really thinking about Lot D as tra you know, both transitional and permanent space, but it could be the place where you have weekend concerts or you have a first Friday that's branded by, you know, a sponsor of some sort or another. And it could be the place where you highlight the reopening retail, you highlight returning or new retail, and it gives you an opportunity to keep the focus on Ellicott City because all of a sudden you have media that says, come to Ellicott City on Friday, we're going to have food trucks and a band and, you know, whatever. It could be First Thursdays kind of a thing, but it's an opportunity to keep the eyes on Ellicott City now and to activate that space on an ongoing permanent basis. And we just had wanted to share with you some images of, you know, the kinds of things we're talking about. Outdoor markets, you know, you could, we, would, we would love to see, have outdoor seating, you know, at some of your restaurants to be able to people sit outside with their dogs. You know, just a fun kind of kitschy rendering of the outdoor city. Oops. So that's where we are. And thank you very much. And I would just like to turn it over now to Jimmy Ree, who's going to speak to you about kind of the third piece of our puzzle. So thank you so much. I'm not going to go extemporaneously. I'm going to read my notes. Um, if I go extemporaneously, I have so much to say. Someone told me that going extemporaneously is like having a baby. It's easy to conceive but hard to deliver, okay? <laughs> so I, I chose the opposite direction, okay? <laughs> Harder to conceive new ideas but easy to deliver, okay? But anyway, uh, let me first say, uh, <clears throat> working for the governor for the past two years, I realized something. We have great leadership in our county and in the state. Um, from Governor Hogan to your county executive, Kittleman, and we have people such as Delegate Bob Lanigan who show up here tonight. I know how busy he is. And uh, all the government people from Mark, and so all of you. I, I'm not going to name all of you, but I'm truly impressed. And uh, I can honestly state, state this. Their commitment to making this place, your place, a better place to live, where businesses thrive, and where government actually serves its people, but that commitment is second to none, okay? So um, I am really grateful to be part of you, okay? Now, I've lived in Howard County for the past 25 years, so I'm, I'm, I, this is my place, right? And uh, I do frequent the main street from time to time, sometimes for the right reason, to buy gifts for my wife, sometimes for the wrong reasons, happy hours, right? But I do go there frequently, so I know thing or two about the place over there, right? Um, and last night, as we were interviewing people, there were a lot of differing opinions, conflicting, sometimes confrontational. I mean, it was something to behold, okay? But, you know, I don't consider that as a problem. That's an opportunity. As There's a saying that you hit the iron when it's hot, okay, to join them together. And I think people's hearts are the same thing. When there's a confrontation, there's an opportunity for us to understand each other better and come to some common accord so we can take joint action. So that's what we hope to achieve here, right? So what do we need to make this happened, this being all the presentations that were made before you, okay, the vision and the retail stores. Simply, it's about how do we get there from here, okay? Well, you need a vehicle, and you also need a mechanism uh, through which you can set rules 
imports them so that we can all get there. Um, so with that, the first step is ident identifying organizations with mission, resources, competence, and also commitment to help us get there. Because action is impossible without organizations vested with the authority to act. And everybody knows that's just common sense, okay? Now, we want to make sure that they are authorized or they are allowed to create this shared vision, okay? To prepare all of us to get there, whatever the destination may be. And that has to be the first step. If that is not the first step, that is like putting your first button on the second hole. Every button thereafter goes into the second wrong holes, okay? So that is the very important part. So who are those institutions? Um, whoever they are, they are organizations that can shape the outcome that we envision. They can facilitate programs. They can make adjustments as necessary. They can enforce rules, guidelines uh, as required, and garner support whenever you need them. So we selected four of them. You know three of them, okay? We think these are the uh, entities that you have to work with. They have to, to work with. They have to work with each with each other. Now, interesting thing is this: we selected them because, as a unit, okay, these four provide the five P's that we think are critical to the success going forward. They're like four P's of marketing, right? Um, one, performance. Performance re related to economics, commercial, social, and so on. They impact those factors. Two, the population. Inviting visitors, um, soliciting shoppers, uh, improving quality of life to conveying the sense of part participation to the population. That's important. And those four organizations impact that issue. And third, politics, whether it's governing, whether it's budgeting, they certainly have a voice. And four, people, especially the business people on the main street, they impact the entrepreneurial skills, they impact how people innovate, because you have to innovate, okay? You cannot do the same old thing over and over again. You do live in this era of globalization, okay? You compete, right? Remember, just if you're not the most innovative, if you're not the most efficient player, whether it's retail, whether it's warehousing, whether it's whatever, you're gonna compete in price. There's always somebody cheaper. You're gonna have to find yourself to be uniquely different and you're gonna to have to innovate. So they impact that factor as well. And of course, they impact the fifth one, the property, the property value, the property usage, and so on. The next, we're gonna talk each one of them uh, individually, our county. Um, now, the government's role is pretty broad, okay? I don't really have to elaborate on that. Uh, but I think its most important role within the context of what we are talking about is creating that master plan. Why? Because that master plan is, is your broad vision for the future. It's your philosophy. It's your core philosophy that's going to um, determine uh, how you facilitate that effort. That's very important. And that implicitly states because of that importance that you're gonna to have to bring in all stakeholders. Who are they? Well, you define that, okay? There must be multiple stakeholders to this issue of Main Street revitalization. And two, um, because Howard County serves a broad constituent basis, its influence is huge, okay? Its action impacts all of you, no exception. And uh, it also has many tools to help you with, help you achieve your goals. 
politically, it can help you. Administratively, it can help you. Legislative, yes. Budgetary, yes. Regulatory, yes. So it has a tremendous authority to help you get there. It's a very important entity. And then there's Elica City Partnership, founded in 2013 as a nonprofit 503C organization. Its mission is very clear, to preserve the heritage and vitality of historic Ellicott City while enhancing and creating economic growth, okay? That's the uh, legacy of the merger, isn't it? Ellicott City Restoration Fund plus Ellicott City Business Association, right? Heritage and economics. So his mission is pretty clear to me, okay? And also we found out that, and we sense this, there's a tremendous support, broad-based support for what ECP uh, should do, okay? ECP's mission and so on. And uh, given that, concerning the implementation of all the, whatever the plan that you come up with towards your vision, I think the ECP needs to be the voice for the Main Street program. It needs to be the leader as far as facilitating the vision going forward. Um, it needs to be bold, okay? Take that step forward with conviction and commitment. I think that's absolutely essential here, okay? Leading by example is another way to put it, right? <clears throat> because it's, and also, it's influence, when you think about it, it's huge, okay? ECP can impact and establish rules and guidelines essential for retail success, from setting standards to how to brand your business, to brand the district here, and so on. So it has a huge role to play. It certainly has, it has carrots as well as stick, okay? And that's what ECP is all about. And then the, uh, the third group, we're gonna call them major property owners. One, public. That's our county government, the courthouse, okay? DNO, museum there, post office. Um, and then two, we found out there's a concentrated ownership on Main Street. Um, few people own close to three quarters of the property uh, on Main Street. So question here is, um, is there a conflict among the three? Or is there a synergy? Okay, it depends on your paradigm, okay? We think one plus one is three. We think there is a opportunity here that you need to leverage. Um, think about the synergy, okay? You can provide the tenants with greater transparency, um, consistency concerning the property usage, concerning how business is conducted, and also you can give those shoppers a greater shopping experience by working together. There's a visibility, there's a consistency. All of these are important attributes for your success. So these three property owners, they have responsibility to get together in a small room somewhere and see how they can work together, okay? That's just a hint, right? And then last but not least is the Interjurisdictional Task Force. This does not yet exist, but it should. Why? Because you have two counties, okay? You have two counties either separated by or joined by the river, okay? You are either Buddha and Pest or Buddha Pest. Which are you? You decide. I don't know. That's your decision, right? Um, but so both sides must recognize the river is your asset, okay? It's not something to hide. It's not something to avoid. That is your asset, okay? That's your strength, right? So imagine the possibility of working together, right? Rather than competing, but cooperating and maximizing your resources. Um, <clears throat> the, just, just, just look at the, uh, the synergistic possibilities on accessibility, getting there from both sides, through Baltimore County, through Howard County, okay? Getting there, the connectivity of uh, bike trails, running, I mean, it's, it's amazing what you can connect. In today's economy, 
you gain economic strength by connecting interdependent parts, okay? You have a tremendous potential here to connect whatever the interdependent parts you deem are important for the viability of both jurisdictions. Do you have that opportunity here? And of course, when you join your assets together, you are, your marketability is greater, okay? You're stronger, you're bigger, you're larger, okay? Um, <clears throat> The scalability on, on, on marketing, the public-private partnership opportunities put together, they all result in one thing, greater profitability for businesses that operate there. Now I'm going to leave uh, to my colleague by concluding that um, creating this proper mechanism to legitimize and implement your shared vision, I think, is absolutely critical, and uh, that should be the first step. So I'm going to leave it to my colleague, Brad. Thank you, Jimmy. I just want to bring these parts together, focusing on things we've talked about doing, institutions that we think are important, and bringing those together, what does each player get to do? The county can take a strong lead through this upcoming master planning process on things about which everyone agrees in the public realm. Everyone agrees that pedestrian safety is important, right? It's a win-win, everyone agrees. Everyone agrees that wayfinding is important so that people know where they're going and know how to get there. Now, someone is eventually going to mention the P word, so I'll just say this. Parking is a very hot topic. It is a very animated topic. It is a very um, personal topic. And we respect the fact that it is a, a topic of great concern to everyone in the room. We are not traffic engineers, and we have been here 36 hours. So we're not in a position to tell you with great certainty where every car should go along Main Street. We would say this. Howard County, several years ago, did commissioned a transportation study by traffic engineers who gathered data, who analyzed over the course of the day where cars were, how long they were there, whether they moved uh, morning, afternoon, evening, Monday through Sunday. They gathered the data and they put forth a credible scientific analysis of what should be done. We think whatever decisions are made, that it should be based on a similar methodology so that we can take the passion out of the topic and just make it a management issue, a data-based management issue that even if everybody doesn't get exactly what they want, you can understand the rationale, right? It's based on these numbers and these recommendations by an updated report by a crew of people that do this professionally. And then maybe we can take that down a little bit and just make it a topic. The last thing I want to recommend that the county do is the county should is really in a position to help build up the ECP. The ECP is really going to end up becoming the voice of Ellicott City and the local management entity that, that takes responsibility for these topics. And it is getting there. It is making progress. It is moving forward, maybe not as quickly as everybody would like, not, maybe not exactly the way everyone would like, but it is making progress. And Howard County can be there to help nurture it along to the point where it becomes the self-supporting, standalone entity that really can be the driving force for positive change. Well, we're talking about the partnership. The partnership has its own homework. It has to learn to lead. Leading is not easy. There are lots of false steps, lots of mistakes, lots of unhappy people. But what I have gotten uh, universally from every um, board member I've spoken to, from everyone working with the partnership on a committee, is the sense that they are ready. They want to lead. They want to grapple with these things and stop going to meetings about them. It's been forever. The time is now. 
and I feel that talking to everybody associated with it. So learning to lead and building this organization is going to be the next great task. But with that task, you can do great things, right? You can deal with the cleaner, greener, safer stuff that everybody knows we need to deal with, right? I wish I had a committee of people that could help me take care of just my house, just me and my wife, and my kids are not helping. And you have an institution that can do that. It may not have done it perfectly in the past. It can do it now. It can also be the enforcer, and the establisher and the enforcer of common standards. A professional business behaves in this way. A professional business is open during these hours. A professional business participates in the common work that we are all doing. And it doesn't have to do that. I, I've, heard, I've heard many people say, well, we're all individuals. We're individual property owners. We're individual business owners. You can't make anyone do anything. Everybody's here because they want to be an individual. That's fine, but the ECP has carrots, right? It has leverage. What kind of leverage would a committee like this have? Well, let's say you wanted to put together a marketing campaign, right? And you wanted to have a coupon book of all the great restaurants and shops in Ellicott City, right? You could just say that everyone who conforms to these minimum baseline standards gets to be in the book. Everyone is welcome. You just have to be open at the times it says in the book. You just have to be, you know, have a clean stoop when people get there. And if not, you don't have to, it's all voluntary, you don't have to participate, but we've got a bunch of carrots over here. Right? And if you under, ever ended up with a parking garage, and I'm not saying you should, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but if scientific engineers recommended that you did, and there was a, park, a parking validation program, maybe the stories that meet minimum standards get parking validation, right? More and more carrots. You can just keep building them in. The ECP can also work with Howard County Tourism and Promotion on a comprehensive branding and marketing approach for Ellicott City. We just had a conversation. It's what they're thinking about. They're thinking about these issues, how to make it happen. They're going to need local people to help them build that. You can do that now. It can happen right now. And then you have something to say when facing the outside world. Now let's talk about these property owners. The first thing that Howard County needs to do is start to think of itself as a vested property owner. And to realize that to a large extent, it does not have to herd cats it can, begin to, it can begin to drive this bus by making smart decisions with its own assets. It doesn't have to chase down every absentee landlord. It, it can take constructive action, and it can do it with private enterprise, not on its own. And it can do that here, and it can do it in other places you've mentioned, including, I just want to mention, this is an amazing building. And I love the visitor center. It's terrific. But is the visitor center the only thing that could happen here? And what would a celebrity chef do with a building like that? Right? So it's worth asking these things. Are we really using the highest and best use with all of our assets? We're a property owner. What are our investments accomplishing? Could we put our money into a different portfolio? And lastly, oh, this is labeled wrong. This is about that interjurisdictional thing. This is one functional unit. And one way I know that is that the best signage announcing your arrival in Ellicott City is in Baltimore County. Right? The dirt doesn't know it's in the wrong county. The trees don't know they're in the wrong county. And there are major issues that you are going to want to deal with in the coming generations. Now, I'm not, I use, as I said, King Arthur flour. I bake pizza every week. It's delicious. With, Great flour. But the chances of that being a flour mill 100 years from now are less than 100%. And if this building were in Baltimore, it would have developers crawling all over it. right? So one day, it will not be a flour mill, and then it will be something. 
And you and Baltimore County need to start thinking now about what that something should be, right? Because it is the single largest structure in your combined Budapest town. And it could be the population base which drives a new wave of retail. It could be a river walk. It could be a major parking lot. It could be the trailhead of a major trail system. It could be all kinds of things, but if it's not your problem because it's across the river, then you're never going to have a say in it. And if you want it to be something, you're going to need to work with Baltimore County to get it there. And for everyone else we haven't mentioned, aim high. Uh, you know, Thoreau said that a man only ever hits what he's aiming at, so aim high. That's our presentation.